Good morning. It's great to be here in Munich, my, one of my favorite cities. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here today at the uh, 2010 Nokia Q Developer Days Conference. Um, DreamWorks Animation is, of course, in the movie making business. We make computer generated or CG movies. But to make our movies and tell stories with stunning imagery, uh, we create a lot of software. So in many ways, we're also a technology company. Today, I'm gonna to give a high level overview of how we make our animated CG movies, how and why we make software tools, and where Qt fits into our overall strategy for making world-class films. I'm gonna discuss our animation pipeline, which defines the overall workflow and uh, for our artists and the software tools that they use. And we're gonna look at also the hardware infrastructure that our software runs upon. I'm gonna describe also our software development environment and also discuss the primary motivations that drive our research and development at DreamWorks Animation. And I'm gonna wrap up by also looking at how we've got Qt in our organization and uh, what's gonna be happening in the coming year. But before we dig in, I wanted to pause and highlight another session today at 1 p.m. that's part of the Qt in Use track. One of our principal, en principal engineers and lead UI designers, uh, Gene Reagan, is gonna be giving a talk about how he worked to bring Qt into the DreamWorks organization. And he's also gonna be talking about the next generation lighting tool that he's been working on for the past couple of years. Gene's a great speaker and an excellent engineer, so I encourage you guys to go see that, that talk later today at one. So, since we're gonna be talking about how we make movies, I thought that it might be a good idea to start with a short clip from one of our movies that came out earlier this year. Oh, come on, let me out, please. I need to make my mark. Well, you make plenty of marks. All in their own place. Please, two minutes. I'll kill a dragon. My life will get infinitely better. I might even get a date. You can't lift a hammer. You can't swing an axe. You can't even throw one of these. Okay, fine, but this will throw it for me. <laughs> See, now this right here is what I'm talking about. It, it, mild calibration. No, no, Hicker. If you ever want to get out there to fight dragons, you need to stop all this. But you just pointed to all of me. Yes, that's it. Stop being all of you. Oh, oh yeah. You, you, sir, are playing a dangerous game. Keeping this much raw Vikingness contained, there will be consequences. I'll take my chances. Salt sharpen now. <laughs> okay, so that was a short clip. I also wanted to talk a little bit about terminology, um, since we're going to be talking about 3D movies. I wanted to talk about the difference between 3D and stereo 3D. So we've been making uh, 3D movies at DreamWorks Animation for over 15 years, starting with Ants in 1995. And they're called 3D because we model and manipulate the characters and objects in a 3D space in our tools. In 2009, we started releasing all of our movies in stereo 3D, which is often confusingly called just 3D. Now, stereo 3D uses two separate images per frame, one for the left eye and one for the right eye and uh, this provides for a much more immersive 3D experience for the audience. And as you probably uh, can tell if you've gone to a 3D movie recently, we've come a long way since the uh, earlier days of flimsy red uh, and blue plastic glasses. So, what does it take to make an animated film at DreamWorks Animation today? Well, it starts with a great idea, then lots of artistic creativity, lots of effort, and of course, iteration. From start to finish, our films take about four years. The first two years uh, involves a relatively small team that work on the movies. Recently, we just hit the 2,000 employee mark, so we've been growing quite a bit over the last two years. Our movies are 100% computer generated, so that means we render every pixel of every frame. And for a 90 minute movie, that's a lot of data. The data rate for a stereo 3D film is about 100 million pixels per second. And we have over a thousand terabytes of online disk storage. Each movie takes about a hundred terabytes, 
for their uh, working space, and that's used for the final images, but also for lots of digital assets and all the intermediate files that are used through the process of making the film. And we, of course, use a lot of compute power. We have over 20,000 cores collectively on our render farms, and so this essentially puts us into the realm of supercomputing. Pushing the boundaries of animation and special effects means that we're pushing constantly on the boundaries of our compute resources. Uh, here you see a graph of CPU time from the original Shrek to Shrek Forever After, which came out earlier this year, which is a period of about 10 years. And as you can see from the graph, there's been uh, tremendous growth in uh, the rendering time needed for our movies. We write custom software for virtually every phase of the CG movie making process. We have five million lines of code that collectively are used to create eight major GUI applications, and then we have over 2,500 smaller tools that are used to create what we call the animation pipeline. So lots of software. We organize our artists and the software at the studio around what's called the animation pipeline, and there are three main phases to the pipeline. The first part is the pre-production part, then production, and then post-production. Together they have roughly 16 different pipeline stages, and each of these stages has a dedicated group of specialized artists and technicians for that, technicians for that area. The work products, or the digital assets, flow from one group to the next, from one pipeline stage to the next, and along the way there are thousands of different tools that create the assets or modify the assets. They flow through the pipeline going through various transformations and conditioning until they're, they reach the end of the pipeline where they're fused together to make the final frame. And while this looks like a linear process, in reality there's a lot of feedback loops which I didn't show because as uh, the artwork is reviewed and, and approved or not approved, it flows back to the front of the pipeline and lots of iterations are made. So during the course of those two years in production, um, there's a lot of different feedback loops between these groups. So I wanted to do a, uh, take a quick, brief look at the, uh, a few of the stages in the pipeline just so you get an idea of what it looks like to make a movie. So to start with, the key to a great film is to start with a great story. And uh, at the studio, at any given time, we have lots of different stories that are under development, and the ideas often come from books like Shrek or How to Train Your Dragon. Here we see storyboards being used to, to show the, uh, the story to an audience, and that's called pitching the story. The storyboards are drawn by hand, but we've added technology over the years to make it easier and more efficient for the artists to do their drawing. We use what are called Cintiq tablets, which are essentially flat monitors with integrated digital drawing surfaces on the top. And that allows the artist to use traditional drawing techniques, but they can move a little bit more quickly and they have features like copy or undo, which can be helpful. Now, while the story is being boarded, other artists and the art directors work on how the film will look. And we call this stage visual development, or VizDev for short. The character design also happens at this stage. Now, here are some Vikings. This is just one of the many paintings that was done in the early days of How to Train Your Dragon to just get the feel of the movie and, and capture what the themes might be like. Designers work on the look of the characters, and they also work on how they will act and what their various expressions might be. For How to Train Your Dragon, uh, we realized early on that we would need a lot of long hair and fur-covered clothing for the Vikings, and of course, interchangeable weapons. Now once the characters are in design, the 3D modeling process begins. We model the characters, but sometimes also their clothing, and each pose takes roughly two weeks per character. We also build 3D models for the props, or the other objects in the environment. And modeling is one of the areas where we utilize a lot of third-party software. So in particular, most of our modeling is done uh, with tools from Autodesk, in particular Maya, but recently we've also started using Mudbox more and more. The next stage is surfacing, and the artists in the surfacing department work primarily with texture and with color. They create materials that are used to cover the surfaces of, of the models, and this controls what they're going to look like when light is applied to the surfaces. The human skin in particular requires lots of special surfacing work to be convincing, and until a, a character is surfaced, you really don't know what it's going to look like. 
Layout is the stage where the assets are arranged in the scene and where the starting and the ending uh, positions of the characters are established. And layout is also where much of the cinematography is done, which involves setting the camera positions and the camera movement for each of the shots. Here we see a frame in the layout stage on the top, and then that same frame at the bottom after the surfacing and the lighting and the effects have been applied. So we talked about modeling a character, but how do we get the characters to move? Well, rigging is where characters are prepared for animation. Gobber here spent about six months getting ready for an animator to move them around in the computer. The rigging artists create the controls that are used by the animator to walk and talk and fight and do all those other Viking things. <coughs> here we see some of the 4,000 controls that were needed to fly the Night Fury. And for reference, a typical human character in our movies uses about half that number of controls, or about 2,000. And when you change a control, it causes pieces of a geometry in the model to either move or rotate or deform in 3D space. And once the controls have been set up by the riggers, then our animation tools allow the artist to manipulate those controls over a timeline, frame by frame, to uh, control the motion in the scene. So effects, of course, play a very big role in our movies, and it helps to make them very exciting and visually interesting. Fire is a very common effect you see in a lot of films, and if you have fire-breathing dragons, then it's especially important. Besides breathing fire, we also have to set things on fire, like the Viking boats in the background here. And fire is achieved basically through a particle simulator, which drives a fluid simulation. And the color of the fire is uh, varied based on the distance from the emitter or the source of the fire, like the dragon's mouth or the wood that's burning. Smoke and fog are also a combination of particle and fluid systems. Now, creating hair is also a very complex process. Um, it begins modeling the hair as strands of geometry, and then riggers create a style system while the effects department develops a uh, motion simulation. Next, the surfacing artists come in and they apply the various qualities like thickness and the color and the tint. And this process takes many weeks to get just a full head of hair for one character. And as with modeling, the effects department uses a lot of uh, third-party software from Maya. Uh, we use it mostly as an effects platform to integrate. And we have hundreds of different custom plugins that we write for Maya to create the effects. Lighting is where all the 3D assets from earlier in the pipeline flow down and become uh, fused together, and it's where really the scene comes to life. Lighting artists literally use hundreds